I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Kenneth Fearing's study of a deadly obsession. Desperate witness. Starring Richard Kramer. Kenan Wynn. And Julie Adams. Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by General Motors, Delco Electronics, and Sign Off. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. a nursery rhyme that refers to the mouse that ran up the clock. That clock is marking time, and time stops for no man. George Stroud, executive editor of Crimeways magazine, will now conduct a search for a man. A man who saw someone enter an apartment building the night of a murder. A desperate witness he alone knows to be himself. Our story will continue in a moment. Absolutely. Lovely dress. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Really? Good old Harry. What a host. When Harry throws a party, nobody goes thirsty. Here, let me freshen up that drink. Good old Harry is such a great host. How come Bill and Jean had such a terrible fight? I want to go home right now. I don't care. I want to go home right now. How come Bob had a little trouble driving home? And how come everybody who felt so good last night feels so bad this morning? Maybe good old Harry is not such a great host after all. Maybe good old Harry is a pusher, a neighborhood pusher. Harry pushes alcohol. So if you serve alcohol, please, don't be a pusher. And if you're a guest, don't let good old Harry or anyone else push you into drinking more than you want. A public service message from this station and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. If I picked the right kind of staff, twisted the investigation where I could, jammed it where I had to, pushed hard where it was safe, it might be a long time before anybody connected me with George Chester. Hopefully before that I could turn suspicion where it belonged, to the real murderer, Janet. Roy Corbett got them all together for me. I'd rely on Roy the heaviest. His office was next to mine. Also, he had the most analytical mind, so I wanted to keep my eye on him. I was behind my desk, playing it cool. The secure executive, as they all trooped in. Right, Ed Orland, Don Klausmeyer, kind of Leon Temple, Matt <laughs> Sterling, and Roy. I've briefed everybody, George, to drop whatever they're currently doing. Fine. Thanks, Roy. Now, you're all being asked to take on a, a rather strange job. It has to be done quickly and quietly. I know I can rely on you. We've been given a blank check as far as the resources of the organization are concerned. If we need help on your particular assignments, just ask. Raid any department you need. Something special, come to me or to Roy here, who's second in command. What's it about? We're looking for somebody, Leon. Oh. Right now, we'll uh, call him X. We don't know much about him. His name may be George Chester. It's possible he's in advertising. But that'll be your assignment, Nat. Combing ad agencies, clubs, PR offices, newspapers, etc., 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 Leon, check all real estate registers, tax records, public utilities, phone books of cities within, say, three, four hundred miles mm -hmm. for George Chester. Yeah. Take all the people you need to help you. I've got it. Now, all we've got is a name, and we're not even sure of that. We haven't even got a good description of him. 
just say he's of average height, say 5'9 to 11, average build, probably between 140 and 190. <laughs> That's not much to go on. Well, he's apparently a regular of a place on 3rd Avenue called Gill's. He was supposedly there last Saturday afternoon with a woman that we know to be a good-looking blonde. That's all we know about her. Now, that'll be your job, Ed. Find this joint, whatever it is, and when you do, stay there until our Mr. X comes into it. Now, on the same evening, our subject went into an antique shop, also on 3rd Avenue. That'll be your gig, Don. All you've told us about this man took place last Saturday. Wasn't that the night Pauline Dellis was killed? She's connected with Janice. He was in Washington... Is that what this is about? No, no connection. Not as far as I know. It's purely a big-time business scandal that Hagen himself and a few others have been digging into. Now it's due to break. Yeah, well, I just thought it's quite a coincidence. No. Do we make inquiries about the blonde woman who was with this guy? Yeah, you'll all have to do that. But we're not looking for the woman or any other outside person. It's I... the man we I... want. Only the man. All right? Yeah. No more mm -hmm. questions? Sure. I suppose you intellectual tramps get out of here and get to work. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. They were gone, except Roy. His was the sharpest, most analytical mind, my greatest hazard. I could feel the wheels in his head turning. I waited while he walked around the desk, then crossed to the wall, facing it, hands thrust into his pockets. He leaned against the wall, staring at the carpet. George, this is a crazy affair. I can't help feeling Don hit the nail on the head. Uh, how do you mean? It's a curious connection there, the fact that all of this happened last Saturday. Mm, I don't understand. Well, I don't mean it has any connection with Pauline Dulles' murder. Of course it hasn't. That'd be a little too obvious. But, but I can't help thinking that something, I, I, I don't know what, something happened last week on Friday or Saturday, perhaps while Janeth was in Washington, that would really explain why we're looking for this mysterious art-collecting stranger at this particular moment and in such a hurry. What do you think? Hmm, sounds logical. There's a rumor that Janeth Enterprises is in real financial trouble. That's why he went to Washington. Did you know that? No, no, I didn't. Well, it's confidential. Don't ask me how I learned of it, but Janeth could be fighting a buyout or a merger. He was standing against the wall, and I was suddenly aware of the picture above his head as though it screamed at me. My whole staff out looking for a man who collected Patterson's? Well, the Patterson stared right back at me. It had hung on my wall so long I no longer saw it. I bought it at the Lewis Galleries two years back, a profile of two faces showing only the brow, eyes, nose, lips, chins, facing each other in confrontation. In style, unmistakably Patterson. The artist called it study and fury. I keep thinking the man we're looking for could very well be tied to the Janet Donahue group. Janet Donahue? Yeah, off the record, they're the ones trying to break Janet Enterprises. I think I ought to, on the side, follow up on that? Good idea. Good idea, Roy. Hell of a good hunch. Follow it up and stick with it. He was hooked for now on a false lead. I held my breath as he moved from the wall. But he didn't glance at the Patterson painting. Closed the door and came back to his own office. When he was gone, I sat for a long time, feeling the aftershock and beads of perspiration all over me. Painting, staring at me all the time I had given orders to find me. It was dangerous, but it would have to stay there. No one had noticed it, but if I moved it, its absence would cry out like a banshee. Now it would have to stay there on the wall, even though at any moment someone might make the connection. I always liked that painting. Now it was a threat. And that Patterson I'd taken home... My wife had seen it. I love you, Daddy. He brought me to the circus once. I love my Daddy more than everything. My Daddy is sweet. My Daddy is regular. My Daddy is skinny. Sometimes when I'm riding in the car with him, he goes so fast I'm sort of scared. Slow down, Daddy. And he might skid and drive the car off the road. Why are you going so fast, Daddy? When Daddy drives, I worry because he's, he he has lots of crashes. Um, a policeman can come right around the corner and my dad might get arrested. I'm scared. Oh, if you're worried about him. 
I get scared because he goes so fast. If you don't care about your own safety, remember that those who love you do. Please, slow down. This message was brought to you by the General Motors Corporation. We'll return to our story in a moment. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Spring and summer are the seasons when most people plan vacations and they go flying off all over the place. And, of course, they bring back a peck of precious pictures. Many camera stores are beginning to paste notices to their counters warning people that airline security measures may ruin photographic film in checked baggage. Some anti-hijacking devices used to check baggage for possible concealed weapons utilize x-rays, which will fog your film whether or not it's been exposed. Therefore, one of the best ways to protect film while traveling is to place it in a strong, clear plastic bag and hand carry it. Even though the film may be clearly visible in the bag, make sure that the airline boarding personnel are aware of the film so that it isn't accidentally subjected to x-rays. This has been a consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. Once I'd got over the initial shock of having dispatched an army of leg men to track myself down, I began to feel more secure. I had one great advantage. I alone knew where each one of them was at all times. I could evaluate the bits and pieces they brought me, could divert their direction, keep them from comparing notes, and discredit anything that got too close for comfort. I'd be under the big clock from now on. It was a desperate race between the police... Janet and myself. Would the police get to me before they got to Janet? Could I get to Janet before Hagen got to me? I sent Mapperson to cover the police. I couldn't send one of my own staff. They were too crime-wise. Mapperson was an intellectual on Future Way staff. Send him to cover a murder story, he'd end up writing a philosophical piece about prison reform. He'd been on staff ten years, probably hadn't spoken a hundred consecutive words to anybody. Anything Mapperson dug up would be for my ears only. And that's what I wanted. He came into my office, his plump face, as usual, vague. His expression, an eternal puzzlement. They took me off my assignment, and I was doing a piece on molecular structure. Emery, I'm involved in a special outside job. The whole staff's working on it. But at the same time, one of the most sensational murders of the year has occurred. Pauline Delos, you must have read the newspaper account. Oh, I believe I glanced at it. Oh, isn't she, uh, uh, Jenna's lady friend? Mm, wasn't she? Right. Well, this special assignment's taking all our time around here, but we can't let crime ways be left at the post. We can't let a big story like the Delos murder get away from us. Well, I'm sorry. I don't understand where I'd fit in. Look, the usual policy would be to break it, give it a big play, 20 or 30 leg men. This time, since my guys are busy, we'll do the reverse. I want you to go in there quietly, alone. You want me to cover it? A totally different approach. Fresh. You'll bring it something new, sensitive, not the usual expose. I want you to keep this assignment to yourself, because I still haven't sold it upstairs, you know what I mean? Well, a crime story, that's so out of my experience. Start at Center Street, Homicide Bureau. Pick up everything as and when it happens. Phone it into me, and me only, everything. I want to be kept up to date on every phase of the Dulles story. Well, now, will, will this be all right with Hagen? You know, he put me on future yeah, ways. Don't worry, now, to... I'll fix it with Hagen. And I'll fix it with Janice, too. That's the beauty of a monolithic organization. The right hand doesn't suspect what the left hand's doing. By the time Hagen found out about Mafferson, I'd either be in the clear, or it'd be too late for me anyway. I rode down to the garage, got into my car, and drove off, intending to go straight home and get rid of that painting I'd bought. But I turned down a side street, and I found myself heading toward Pauline's apartment. It was the first I'd been there since that night. All this energy spent trying to plot my own survival, and I hadn't really stopped to think about her. The image of that beautiful neck, broken and perfect body, lifeless. I had to pull over to the curb, pull myself together, force my mind to look for a weakness, 
a flaw in Janice Alibi. There had to be one. I went back over Saturday night, every step. I'd just taken Pauline home. My car's parked around the corner. I let her off. I'm not going to the lobby, so far as anyone in the building knows, I don't exist. I'm a distance off. I see Janeth drive up. He gets out of his car. He catches up with Pauline. He goes in with her. And what did he do after that? He killed her. Then he had to get away. But he'd sent his chauffeur on. Now, how'd he get to Steve Hagen's? I drove the logical route from Pauline's to Hagen's. Saw two nearby cab stands. Janeth could have used one of them if he'd taken a taxi to Hagen's. Unless he found a cruising cab. Huh. He certainly wouldn't have been so stupid as to pick one up at Pauline's door. The farthest cab stand was the likeliest. I'd begin there, and then I'd try the nearer. No, it was dangerous. Because cabbies talk to cops. No, not yet. I'd have to be careful and wait. I got back to my office just as Roy called in the first report. Hello? It's Roy, George. Listen, I'm at Gill's Tavern with Ed Orland. It's a nut house. You know, this guy's got a museum here that looks like... Well, what'd you find out? Well, the bartender, who's the chief lunatic around here, described our man as intelligent, eccentric. You sound like you don't agree. Well, eccentric, yes, but only a moron would come into a dump like this and spend hours talking to the guy who runs this menagerie. Is that all? Well, the physical description we have doesn't seem far wrong. Nothing to add to it except he's brown-haired, clean-cut. Anything on the blonde? Nothing. Mm, it certainly isn't much, is it? Well, wait. Our man is unquestionably a lush. Who? Oh? Four or five years ago, he was in here every night. Had to be sent home in a cab. At that time, he was a newspaper man. Bartender never heard of him working in advertising. Before he was a newspaper man, he ran a tavern upstate somewhere with his wife. Now, that's all we've got. So what should Ed do? Uh, come back to the office? No, no, no. Our man was in there two days ago. He might turn up any minute. No, have Ed work on the bartender. Psychoanalyze him for more details. Have a few drinks with him. This cook's a human blotter, and he's got some screwy game. Yeah, well, Ed can get drunk with him, but not too drunk. And tell him to try some of the other customers. What's the address and phone number there? I thought I'd pulled it off pretty well. I'm going to keep things on ice for a while. Eccentric, huh? Moron and lush. <laughs> I never saw that when I looked in the mirror. When I touched my shirt. It was soaked with nervous sweat. If you're in the market for a new Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, Oldsmobile, or Cadillac, you can make it a real sensation in stereo sound when you order a Delco sound system factory installed. AM with stereo tape, AM FM stereo, and AM FM stereo with 8-track tape are just some of the systems available. Delco stereo. We think you deserve it on a GM car. Delco Electronics is the sound of General Motors. Sinus flares up. Sometimes your whole face aches. When you need occasional help, get Sinoff tablets, the sinus medicine. Sinoff works with a full dose of pure aspirin for sinus headache, plus a sinus drainer for congestion. That's how Sinoff helps sinus pain while you drain. Remember, for best relief and safety, take sign off only as directed. S I N E O F F. The sinus medicine in the bright red box. The zero hour continues after this. Jihan, ye khandani mansuba bandi ka markas hai. Mais oui, c'est le centre de planning familial. Yes, this is the family planning center. There are family planning centers in more than 100 countries today. The women who come to these centers can't afford to go to private doctors, but they want to plan their children, when they're going to have them, and how many they're going to have. The trouble is, there aren't enough centers. Just in the United States, there are nearly 5 million women who have no way of getting modern family planning help. And that's nothing compared with the world problem. Some countries don't have enough family planning centers. Some don't have any at all. This year, again... Many women will have babies not because they want to, but because they have no choice. Sad for them. Sad for the world. 
With family planning help, these women, too, will have babies only when they choose. So that all the people of the world may have this freedom of choice, support Planned Parenthood. I was getting home later and leaving earlier. My wife, concerned with being cook, nurse, and handholder, our daughter had tonsillitis. Hadn't seemed to notice that the painting was no longer in the dining room. I hoped she'd forgotten it. I had it stashed in the downstairs closet behind all our raincoats. George, you're not leaving without your breakfast. You'll have to, hon. I'll call you. Darling, I don't like the way you look at all. They're, they're working you too hard. <laughs> Try to get home earlier, dear. The worry about how close I was to losing my family, if the truth came out, rode into town with me. Will wanted me in his office, which had taken on the look of command headquarters for World War III. A big blackboard covered half a wall. Cross-reference charts were propped up on desks, tables. I didn't see Leon Temple right away. He was behind a six-foot chart. What do you think of it? You're doing a thorough job, Roy. Uh, I've got our Mr. X charted ten ways from Sunday, all cross-indexed. Reports have begun coming in. See, under uh, background, he may or may not be in advertising. He used to be a newspaper man. Once operated an upstate tavern resort with his wife. Now, that's just a matter of checking every tavern license back as far as necessary. Mm -hmm. It's a start, Roy. Start? More than that. Leon just worked up a report on the Van Barth. I was just going to put it up on the board. Read it to him, Leon. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> it was established that the man in question, whom we know as George Chester, was in the Van Barth Lounge on Saturday night last, sometime between 9.30 and 10. He was carrying an unframed oil painting, which he did not check, and was overheard talking to his female companion about what the painting should be named. The woman with him was one Pauline Dellis. Dellis? Are you sure of that? No doubt about it. George. Oh, sure, sure. Leon checked the waiter, bartender, checkroom girl, all three. Identified her from pictures published in the paper. Now, uh, doesn't this alter the whole character of the assignment? Now, did the police know Dulles was in there Saturday night? Of course. Everybody in the place reported it once they saw the papers. Right, I'm asking Leon. Oh, yes, yes, they know. And do the police know that we're looking for the man who was with her? Well, I didn't give them any information. I followed your exact instructions. Ah, so that's it. Just that they were there. Oh, no, no, no. There's evidence. Um, when they left the cocktail lounge of the Van Barth, our subject left something behind. What? Uh, what, what did he leave? Subject's handkerchief. I've got it here in the envelope. The lady spilled her drink. Oh, I see that. I wouldn't touch it, George. We may be able to raise a fingerprint. From a handkerchief? <laughs> oh, I doubt that. <laughs> Anyway, if they can, I imagine it already has plenty. The waiters, the cashiers, yours. One more set won't matter. Well, even without fingerprints, it can probably be traced. There's, uh, there's a laundry mark on it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, uh, send it to the lab, Roy. You go on with what you're doing. At least I'd publicly handled the handkerchief. Back in my office, I closed the door of my desk on it. Just as Don Klausmeyer came in. I've got some interesting information, George. Any luck with the painting? Yeah, real luck. You know, I uh, found the artist. Oh? Uh -huh. She lives in a loft, paradise for rats and termites. Got four kids, never was married. <laughs> the first of the women's livers. Oh, that's all very interesting. Mm. What's it got to do with our man? Just this. She's the customer who bid unsuccessfully for her own picture that night. A friend saw a canvas in the shop window and told her. She tried to buy it back, but she'd been broke for years and couldn't match our guy's bid. But she did give a detailed description of him. You know, the artist's eye and all that. Let's have it. Yeah, I got the old girl on tape and had it transcribed. Here, let me read it to you. All right. Now, I quote Patterson. The bum that outfit me for my own paintings was a smug, self-satisfied creep just like 10 million other rubber stamp sub-executives. Brown hair, line of gray at the temple, brown eyes, high cheekbones, symmetrical lean features. Face looks like he'd scrubbed and shaved it five times a day. Has one of those $10 hair stylings just over the edge of the ear and curling at the nape of the neck. More establishment than hippie. He's 37, 38, weighs between 160 and 165, 5 feet 10 and a half. 
Gray tweed suit, wide red and black necktie striped with white, wears a wide gold wedding band. A good deal of an exhibitionist imagines he's Omar Sharif, and that's what he plays at being. The woman with him was beautiful, if you like lesbians in standard Park Avenue models. He knows pictures, especially the works of L. Patterson, which he doubtless collects, but only for their snob appeal. Otherwise, he's a totally obnoxious man, unquote. Oh, she uh, didn't miss much, huh? May or may not be a good description. Her opinion, a little biased. You know, George, when I was poking around that studio loft she lives in, looking at acres of her pictures, they all had kind of the same feel. And it reminded me of something I've seen somewhere else quite recently. I was staring straight over his head at Louise Patterson's study in fury on the wall behind him. The only trouble is, <laughs> I can't remember what it is or where I saw it. Well, it'll come back to you. Don't worry about it. I'll see you tomorrow. I took him by the arm and ushered him out so he wouldn't have a chance to turn and look at the painting on the wall. I thought of its mate, the temptation of Judas, in the downstairs closet at home behind our raincoats. It could be discovered and easily if they ever caught up with me. If anyone ever got that far, I was finished anyway. Janice and Steve Hagen would take care of that. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. I'd like you to ask yourself a personal question. What do you feel when you meet a handicapped person? Pity? Admiration? Fear? Are you from the school that teaches a stiff upper lip? Try harder? Fight? Don't let anything stand in your way. Do it. Do what? Learn a skill? Go to school? Develop confidence? Self-respect? Then get turned down by a landlord who doesn't believe you'll pay the rent? By an employer who never hired the handicapped before and who isn't going to risk it now? If we don't believe in the handicapped, then how are they going to believe in themselves? Unless we recognize that they're human beings with feelings, with skills with a sense of responsibility, then we are adding a handicap that they can't overcome. Let's stop handicapping the handicapped. This public service message brought to you on behalf of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and the Advertising Council. It was last summer when I was 18. And I was in love with a girl named Kathy. Kathy was 18, too. It was the happiest summer of my life. I had never been that happy before. I know I'll never be that happy again. It was warm and beautiful. And so we bought a few bottles of wine and drove into the country. We drank the wine and held each other, laughed. It must have been the stars and the wine and the warm wind. Nobody else was on the road. The top was down and we were singing. And I didn't even see the tree until I hit it. Kathy died. I killed Kathy. Stop driving drunk. Stop killing each other. Write to Drunk Driver, Department Y, Box 1969, Washington, D.C. for more information on drinking and driving. A public service message on behalf of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. Desperate Witness. I'm Rod Serling. Today's episode brought to you in part by General Motors, Delco Electronics, and Sinoff. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here... To the Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.